if, uh, if you haven't looked at your calendar, somehow you missed all of the decorations for ghouls and goblins. Today's the 31st of October, which makes it Halloween Day. And I don't know what your neighborhood or community or how you guys approach trick-or-treating, if you do the trick-or-treating thing, but yesterday, my neighborhood decided to do some trick-or-treating, okay? And so we had some friends that come over. We kind of approached this a little bit of light to night kind of thing. Instead of being locked away in our house, we have people come over. We go out in the front yard. We have a fire pit. We talk to our neighbors. We hang out with our neighbors. It's awesome. Some of you hung out with us yesterday. We had a good time. This is a picture of my kids right here. I've got four of them. Uh, starting over there on the left, you can see some of my littles were princesses. They were the most adorable princesses you could ever imagine. They were so, so cute. And then we have my daughter right here who was Maleficent. And then you have my son, okay? So let me set this up for just a second. His best friend, his buddy in the neighborhood was dressed as a ghost and her, his sister was somehow some sort of like soul catcher kind of thing. And so he decided to be a ghostbuster. I like that. I think that's pretty fitting, especially where we're going here in just a few minutes to be a ghostbuster, right? And so we're in this season in October where there's so much interest around the supernatural. There's so much interest around the paranormal. It seems to all come out right here in this month. Last night, when people that were walking around, I saw, I saw a little girl dressed up as an angel. But I saw some that were like more in the demonic side of things. I saw like this possessed looking clown guy last night, man. That thing was scary <laughs> walking around. There's a lot of interest in the paranormal, especially right now. You know, you look at all of the big blockbuster hits. You look at the number one money makers on the big screen right now. And you're going to find they have a similar theme, don't they? It's something to do with the supernatural, something to do with the paranormal, maybe. Zombies or spirits or people being possessed and exorcism. There's something about this idea, and I don't know what it is that people like to be scared. I don't know if you do the scary movie kind of thing. I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, like, you, you scare me and I kind of swing punches, so I just don't do that anymore. I, something about it, though. People like to be scared. And I don't know if maybe watching the movies or something, it just gets that adrenaline rolling, or maybe it's the fact that like later for me, when I would try to come home as an only kid coming into the house, you were scared to like even go in the house or you know, be alone at the house or take a shower or what have you. But with all of this interest, right, with everything happening on the big screen and the box office, with everybody dressing up as ghouls and goblins kind of stuff, the question really sits in this idea. Is it any real or uh, reality to any of this stuff. These things that we see, is there, is there any form of basis for this to build truth on? For a lot of us, we've taken our understanding of the supernatural, of the paranormal, from things that we've seen on the big screens. We've taken our knowledge of what it looks like, what it might be, from books that we have read or consumed, or stories that we've been told. Is it real? Is there any truth to all of this? And so this is the reason that we've been talking about this subject here, about angels and demons. To take a moment and pause in this season, in this time of the year, when everybody's asking questions, when there's lots of interest around it. What does the Bible have to say? What does scripture teach us about these kind of concepts? Is there any truth to what we're being told in culture, what we see in culture? And so this is what we've been wrestling with here over the last few weeks. If you've missed any part of this, today is part three of this. And this, probably more so than a lot of series that we've been teaching on, it compounds, it builds. Meaning part one was the foundation and the basis. And then part two built on that. Part three is going to assume some things that we've already covered. Okay, so let's just review a few truths for just a second because I need you there with me as we go forward. But if you miss these, I'm going to pull a flyby, okay? The format for this whole series is really quick. You're going to see a lot of things come on screen. We're going to hit a lot of scriptures in just a few seconds, a lot of points. And so what I've been encouraging folks to do is you can write quickly. You better have shorthand. 
You can take pictures of screens. You can go back and watch this information later. My main goal is to get you intrigued enough to go home and dig your heels into this stuff, to dig into scripture, to learn some things for yourself, okay, and not just rely on someone else teaching it to you. So let me give you some things that you should go home and research a little bit further today, okay? Can we do that together? All right, so let's review a few truths. Let's review a few things that have come up in this series. Let's go back to the foundation. And so is the question, the question then poses, is there any truth to any of this stuff? Yes, the unseen world is real. We've said it this way, that the unseen realm is indeed real. What I'm not saying to you is there's some little doll named Chucky who grabs some little butcher knife and that's kind of, no. But what I am saying to you is there is more than our eyes see. There is something beyond what we can reach out and touch in the natural, in the physical world. There is a spiritual reality, and it is just as real as the table that holds my iPad. And so we've talked about this idea, but oftentimes we're misinformed around it. We take our cues from culture. We take it from our movies. And so one thing that we talked about last week in here is that not just is the unseen a true reality, God is the creator behind that reality. This is an important part of your framework that God created the supernatural. And when he creates the supernatural, there's different words and languages that are used throughout scripture to define them. Names like spirit or holy ones or God or angels, cherubim, seraphim. Maybe you've read some of these terms if you've looked at the Bible before. So God will give names to these different created creatures. He also defines roles. He gives them responsibilities. We've talked about some of these things in the series. God creates the supernatural beings and, and God created Satan himself. Now, we covered this, but some ask the question, if God created Satan and he's like the epitome of evil, then God, did God create evil? And for your answer, you got to go back to last week. God creates Satan. And this is a really important thing for us to know and for us to understand because God and Satan are not equals. We've covered this stuff up until this point. But in your theology, in your mind, you need to have this framework. Satan is a created being. Meaning that outside of himself, a power exists that is so much greater than him, that he's a created individual. And so God and Satan are not equals. Following the story, maybe you're familiar with what this looks like. This created being, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, he decides inside of his heart, somehow he becomes disillusioned. He decides that he can be greater than the creator. He decides that he can exalt himself, elevate himself. I'm going to be greater than God himself. Above all of the angels, I'm going to sit on the throne. I will be not like the most high. I will be the most high. And so he becomes completely disillusioned. I mean, that's foolish thought, isn't it? To think that somehow we could be greater than the creator. To put ourselves in the position that only God sits in. He's disillusioned in his mind. And somehow we see that he convinces a third of all of the angels. Well, how many angels are there, Pastor Daniel? The Bible describes the number of angels almost as innumerable. Innumerable? All right. That works. As the sand on the seashore. In places we see where Jesus could call on tens of thousands of angels at a moment to pull him off of the cross. How many angels were created? We don't know. A lot, a lot and a lot, and then multiply that again times a lot. Take that number and then look at a third of them, 33%. Somehow this disillusioned devil convinces a third of the angels to get behind his idea that I know better than God himself and you should follow me. That's what the devil does. That's when he becomes so disillusioned and he convinces a third of the angels. And then there's this moment. And I talked about it last week. Enough is enough. God's had enough. Not having this here in heaven. Boom. Kicked out of heaven. Where is the devil now? So the devil's dominion is here on the earth. 
This is an important part. I talked with somebody last week and they said, no, maybe I think the devil is in, well, he's in hell. He's in the abyss. He's been locked away. Come back next week. The disillusioned devil, he's got dominion here. He's roaming the earth. And then he begins to do, well, he begins to do what he does best. He begins to deceive other individuals. We see his character being defined as one as an angel of light. It says that he masquerades. He walks around pretending to be something that he is not. Lies in disguise, the sneaky snake that's been there from the very beginning. And so this disillusioned devil convinces a third of all of the angels. He falls down to earth and now he makes it his goal to deceive as many people as possible. And the ultimate goal is to bring destruction to the life of every individual, to my life, to my family, to you, to your family, to those that you love about, to those that you care the most about. And I'm going to throw a quick time out in here. Last week, I had a conversation with someone, and they were asking genuine conversation, said, hey, you know, I read a lot of the scripture. I've read these things in the New Testament, but aren't these things, well, did they cease to exist because, you know, I don't see them with my eyes? And I would just want to say to you that it's, that's an okay place for you to be. I just want to encourage you to go and look at the scriptures even more and see the reality of what I'm talking about here today, okay? All right, and so... He makes it his deception. He makes it his number one goal for the destruction. And then we find, so he's been kicked out of heaven. We find this place where there seems to be this spiritual war that's going on. It's not just that there is another reality that I can't see. It's actually at odds. There's tension around it. There's war behind it. It says here in Revelation 12, chapter 2, or 12, 12, for the devil has come down to you in what? Help me out. For the devil has come down to you in what? There you go. Because he knows. So he's been kicked out of heaven. He's not happy about it. He's pretty mad. He's ticked off. And now he's here on earth and his time is short. Time is short for what? What is he trying to do? And what is he trying to accomplish? His time is short. He knows that his time is indeed short. Revelation 12, 17, just a few verses, just a little bit later than this says, then the dragon became what? Oh, he's mad. He's enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? We looked at this already. This is Eve from Genesis. He's so mad with Eve. And so he's going to set out to do what? He's going to make war against all of and this is where it goes. And follow the line here. It says, and on all of those who keep the commandments of God, who hold to the teachings, to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So fast forward. He's angry. He's ticked off. He's going to make war. And he's going to make war with Eve. And he's going to make war with Eve's offspring. That means you and me. Bro, I didn't even sign up for this. I didn't even know that there was some kind of war going on. Why are you picking me up? Because you belong to him. And therefore, war has been waged against you, against us. And so we see that there's this battle that's going on. We see that there's this personal thing that's happening. But the tension, the reality of is this. Most of us are in this position, one of these. We're unaware. I can't see it. It must not be real. I'm unaware. There are so many of us who are going through life that while we may see, oh yeah, there has to be something beyond. There are too many strange things happening that I can't explain. But we go through here. Maybe we are aware, but we're completely unarmed. A war has been waged against you with your target on your back. And you're defenseless. So many of us are unprepared or we're unprotected. A war that has been waged. 
And so one of the things that we've covered each week, and I just want to make sure you get this, we are not here to talk about demons or the devil to somehow lift him up, to elevate him, or to make much of him. Quite the contrast. Our purposes in talking about this stuff here in the series is because there's a spiritual war that's going on, and Ephesians, or 2 Corinthians lays it out to us this way, so that we would not be, last time here together, that we would not be outwitted, we would not be ignorant of his designs. His designs, his plans, his schemes, his purposes. There is a plan. And so we're slowing down and talking about it so that we would not be out schemed. And so today, as we fast forward through the process, as we compound and build on where we've been over the last few weeks, today I want to talk about spiritual warfare for just a bit. We base this out of Ephesians, and this is a familiar passage we've looked at here. For our struggle, this war, this thing we're wrestling with, this battle that we find ourselves in, It's not against flesh and blood, it says, but against the rulers, authorities, the powers, the forces of evil in heavenly realms. Now, Paul knows a tremendous amount about the supernatural. He knows a lot about the paranormal. He's leaning into this idea here and begins to help us see that there's a spiritual war that's going on. Everybody good so far? All right. So now let's kind of talk and unpack it a little bit. I want to set this up in two parts here. One, today is going to be about this warfare that happens with you and I. And then next week, we're going to talk about a warfare that's happening on a global level. Okay. And so let's talk about this personally a little bit today. And let me help you to see a few more truths that you need to know as we build on this. One is this, that Satan has permission to tempt you. He has permission This is important for you to understand as we build this theological framework. He has permission. So maybe you remember the conversation where Jesus is talking to Peter. Now, Jesus himself, and he refers to Satan as if he's real. He says to Peter, Satan has asked, meaning he wants permission to sift you as wheat. You remember this? He tells Peter... You're about to go through some temptation that I'm going to allow to happen in your world. Did God create the temptation? We'll see it in a minute. But he's going to use the temptation to shape Peter in a way that will forever change him. You understand? And so we find that the devil has permission to tempt us. We see where he was given permission by Jesus when he's going to tempt or aka sift Peter. We also find another place inside of scripture where Job, do you remember this one? So Satan goes to Job and he basically calls Job out and basically says to him, hey, listen, he wouldn't be serving you if you hadn't blessed him so much. God says, okay, you have permission to test him. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is what? Job's life, God, it's sometimes hard to put your mind around some of these things that happens here, but God uses these things. Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for the good of those who love him, right? So he uses this form of temptation. He used it in Peter's life and he uses it in Job's life, but he grants permission. He says, okay, I'm going to give you permission. Use your power. Use your influence. You can tempt Job. You can test Job, but I got to draw the line somewhere. You need to understand this. The line has been drawn. Let me be clear with you. God says to Satan, do not, do not, So there's places of influence, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And so Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord. So you have these different places where there's this temptation, where there's permission that's being granted for it. The devil begins to use that temptation. He tempts Job. But there is this level here of where there's a line that's drawn. And I said a little bit of this last week, but I I need you to see this. Satan's authority is limited to the permission granted him. Satan's authority is limited to the permission that is granted him. Permission granted by God or permission granted by you. Satan's 
authority is limited to the permission that has been granted to him. And so let me just show you this. Let me, let me show you, okay? And so this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is verse 13, and it says this. No temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not let you. He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are, when you're tempted, he's going to provide what? A way out. And so I see this idea here inside of scripture in so many different places where it seems to be that the devil has permission to come and tempt you. He does not have permission to control your decision. He tempts and then you decide. That's what we see. There is a way of escape. You're never going to be tempted beyond a position where you couldn't handle it, where you couldn't find the way out. And so, yes, the devil has permission to tempt you. But no, we do not get to say, the devil made me do it. And this is part of the conversation and why I bring this up, because this is one of the things that happens in Christian cultures. One of two things. Either we completely ignore the fact that there is a devil, or we go so far over here that the devil is behind everything that we do. Scripture teaches us that he has permission to tempt but we have a choice. We have the ability to choose what we're going to do. How do I know that? Because there's other places when Paul wrote this, he says, do not give the devil, and this was that word we looked at last week, do not give the devil a what? You remember what it means? Do not give the devil a foothold. We helped you with a little bit of illustration last week. It's kind of like your door being cracked open, right? I've got a closet door, a bedroom door. Let's call it the front door of my home. I should come in and I should close it and I should probably secure it by putting on the deadbolt. I should close that door. A foothold is when a door is supposed to be closed and you left it cracked open and the devil has wedged his foot in there and now the door is propped open. And what that means, just revisiting last week, what that means is he gets to come in and out, in and out of your life of your situations as he chooses, as he pleases, because you granted permission by giving the devil a foothold. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a little bit of, it's not gonna go too far. I can keep this under control. It's just a little white lie. It does not matter. I'm just cheating just a little bit. I just need to get ahead. God understands. All of these kind of ideas end up as footholds. Just little bits that crack the door open, that grant a little bit of permission. He's got his foot wedged in there, and now he has access inside of your life. What happens is that these temptations lead to footholds. When we're tempted by something and we actually succumb to the temptation and we open up the door and now we're in the position where we've given the devil a foothold. Why don't we give the devil a foothold? Because footholds lead to strongholds. I need you to get this idea. This is better than your amens at the moment. Footholds in your life. And I'm telling you from personally, having walked through it before, having spent a portion of my life trying to overcome footholds. When you open up the door and you give the devil permission and access into an area of your life, you continue down that path and it will become a stronghold. Now, if you're not a church person very often, you probably don't know what this term means. It's a military term. It means to fortify an area. It means that he's moved in and has dominion over this area. And it means that now he's got such a grip on this that it's fortified. And now he gets to play it out however he sees fit. So a person who starts off with a temptation and gives a foothold, they just try a thing one time, it becomes an addiction. Addiction is like a stronghold. Maybe we have things inside of our marriage and maybe it was pornography and we're looking at something. It's just a visual. I just clicked over here. I don't love my wife any less, but now you end up in a position where you got some sort of stronghold that started to build up. How do you know when it's a stronghold? 
That thing keeps repeating itself. I said I wasn't going to do this anymore. I said I wasn't going to be here. I was done with that. That was behind me. I'm not going there. How do you know when it's a stronghold? When that thing, it's like you got some kind of meat hooks in your heart. It means that he can leave you alone for most of the time, and then you let things start going well. You let yourself start growing or get close. To, and then there seems to be, oh, I'll just snatch that hook right back. I'll just pull you back into line. I got you where I want you. The devil believes he has you where he wants you. When he has a stronghold in your life, he does. Do not give the devil a foothold. Why? Look, I got some students in here today. Look right here at me. Do not open up doors in your life at the age that you're at now because it will give a foothold to what he wants to do for the rest of your life and it will become a stronghold and then you'll navigate some of the nonsense that I had to navigate. Do you understand? The people who are amening around you are men and women who have walked through some of the stuff that what I'm saying is true. Don't give the devil a foothold because footholds lead to strongholds and strongholds are fortified positions of the enemy of your soul that you have given permission into your life. He gets his hooks in you. Do you understand another thing about strongholds? Are you familiar with a concept within scripture of like a generational curse kind of thing? You're, you're familiar with this? You've heard about this? Like the sins of the father should be passed down to the son and the child and it continues from one. I'm not trying to get into that theologically, but what I want you to understand is that when you have a stronghold in your life, the propensity, the thing that is natural to happen is for you to pass that on, for them to inherit your, I have not churchy words for this stuff, for them to inherit all of the stuff that has plagued you, you pass that stuff on. Strongholds move from one generation to the next generation. One father commits adultery on the mother. Now the child grows up and continues to do the same thing. One man has an addiction to alcohol. Now you find the next generation begins to struggle with alcohol as well. Put drugs or pornography or whatever things you want to insert. What happens in the home, you give permission, you give dominion, and now he has a foothold, he has a stronghold, hold I'm a father of four children none of this gets me moving like when I see the devil begin to knock on the door of my children and I don't know what you're doing as a parent but I refuse I refuse I refuse to lose the battle that we're in, the war that's been waged. I refuse to let my children fall victim to the strategies straight out of hell. That's a choice. It's a conscious effort my wife and I are making. So how do we take a stand? What do we do about all of this? If I'm engaged in war, there's a battle that's going around, on around me. If I'm the target on my back and then my children are the target, what do I do about all of this? How do we overcome? Where do we go? How do we make sure that there's not footholds or strongholds? And if there are footholds or strongholds, how do we get rid of them? So Paul talks a lot about this idea and I... Paul leans into this in 2 Corinthians, and we've looked at this just a little bit, but he says this. He says, for though that we live in the world, we're not going to wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not what? They're not weapons of this world. So we're in this spiritual battle. There's this war that's going on around us. All of my life, I've been taught how to train or been trained how to overcome, how to see victories in my life, but never this. Never understood the weapons that were mine to wield. I understood the weapons of the world. I tried those to get myself out of a lot of situations. You know what I found out was when I was using weapons of this world, when I would defend myself or I'd somehow muster up the courage to try to push this thing back and defeat this thing. Do you know what it was really like? It was like taking a water gun and trying to put out the fires of hell. It was like me maybe taking a rock and trying to hit a roaring lion that was rushing towards me. All I seemingly did was make the situation worse. Weapons, here's the choice. 
weapons of this world or heavenly weapons? Weapons of this world or heavenly weapons? This is the thing that Paul is talking about here. He says, listen, the weapons that you're trying to fight with, it's not working and you know it. And that's why I'm here to tell you, Paul would say, there's a whole other set of weapons that you're just not leaning into. You're not leveraging. Why are you being defeated? Why is this devil pushing you back? You're supposed to have victory. It's because you just keep trying the same things that you thought were going to work and you're still in the places of defeat. The weapons of this world are not going to get you the victory that is yours. Weapons of this world are the weapons of heaven. And so here we find Paul, he goes on and he writes a lot about these things and he writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter six. And just context of this stuff here, so there's a lot that happens in Ephesus and they're a culture of the occult, witches and warlocks. There was mysticism around them. And so Paul just immediately jumps in and uses language that they would be familiar with around them. He talks again, he's like, hey, it's not against the flesh and blood, it's not against the authorities, it's not against all of those kind of things. They understood that well. What was also interesting about Ephesus is its position to the Roman Empire. Now, you've probably seen pictures, but the people in Ephesus would have been very familiar with Roman culture, with Roman military, with Roman authority, with Roman soldiers. And so Paul does what he does so well. He begins using analogies from the world around him to help paint pictures to get people to see what it is he's trying to say. And so Paul, he tells us, he's like, hey, there is a war that's going on. It's against rulers, principalities. It's about things in heavenly realms. You're not going to fight it with the weapons of this world. There's an entirely different weapon set that's been afforded to you. And so then he's going to begin to lay this out. And what you'll find is he's using a warrior's language, a soldier's language, when he says this as he continues on. So we had this, and then in verse 13, he says, therefore put on, and maybe you've read this before, therefore put on the what? The full armor of God. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day, not if the day, when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to do what? Stand your ground, and after you have done everything, then you will continue to stand. And so he's laying out this idea, this full armor of God, and he says this, and he lays out these different pieces of armor. He says, stand firm then, and let's say these together as we go through. Stand firm with the, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate plate of righteousness in place and with the next one here and with the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all of this here's the last of his list take up the the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and then he ends it with these last two here take the helmet of salvation and the sword of of the spirit and the sword of the spirit. You know, he's talking about Roman culture, but honestly, I think it could just parallel to maybe a modern soldier. We've had a lot of military families and friends who are a part of this. I was having uh, a part of our church body. I was having a conversation just this past weekend with someone in the military about these ideas, talking through what it looks like from their vantage point as a soldier being prepared for battle and absolutely, yeah, Paul's absolutely right. If we're not prepared, if we don't have these things, we are set ourselves up for defeat. And so here's the list of all of them. You can show this. Here's the list. It's the belt of truth. It's the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of readiness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that we're in this spiritual warfare. And I think about war. I think about bombs and tanks and machine guns. Paul thinks about a belt. How do you start a list about warfare with a belt? Could you be more boring, Paul? <laughs> I'm not going to run into battle with my belt. That seems silly. Paul knows something about that belt of truth, doesn't he? See, the liar, the devil, the deceiver, what does he do? 
He spits lies in disguise. And Paul knows this idea. He's like, listen, hey, if you want victory, then you need to have the belt of truth because the truth holds it all together. It's this thing that binds it all, that holds it all. The truth of God, who he is, your position in God. Paul starts to list there with the belt of truth. It holds it all together. It combats deception. And he moves down his list. He starts talking about a breastplate of righteousness. Bless, breastplate of righteousness. Which basically, like if you were to look at modern warfare, that's like the metal plates that go on your front and your back. He's got this breastplate of righteousness. And what is a breastplate meant to do? But to protect. It's meant to protect vital organs like the lung and the heart. And so as we look at Paul talking here and says, hey, if you want to overcome, you need to put on this armor. And one of the pieces that you need to have is a piece of gear that's going to protect your heart. A lot of things are going to happen in this world. They're going to be difficult. There's going to be trials. There's going to be struggles. You need to protect your heart. But you also need to protect your heart against the ways of the evil when lodging themselves on the inside. Protect your heart. Then the shoes of readiness. I was talking with someone earlier today, and they were talking about this part right here. And he says, I like to just call it cleats. You know, put on your cleats because parakletos, the Holy Spirit is with you. Put on your cleats. They have spikes. They're meant to drive you forward. There's this interesting idea here that as he talks about these shoes or these boots or whatever you might want to liken it to of readiness. Put on your shoes and be ready to go. I got my kids, man, and we're ready to walk out the door, and you still haven't put on your shoes? You're not ready to go. You don't have your shoes on. There's this place of being ready, having the shoes on, being prepared. And so he goes on. He talks about the shield of faith. I love that he defines this as one as blocking the flaming arrows. Have you ever had a flaming arrow shot at you before? You know, the words of somebody else. It was just venom. They were just spitting things at you, and it somehow stuck you in the heart. It lodged on the inside of there. You ever had some sort of lies? Maybe the enemy was trying to speak over you. Some flaming arrow that was coming your way. And Paul tells us, you should expect flaming arrows, but you need to be prepared and grab your shield of faith. He tells us that there's this armor that we're supposed to wear. He goes on, he starts talking about the helmet of salvation. And I think this is an interesting one, is our salvation that we have, the mental place inside of our mind. Where does other places, when Paul tells us to be transformed, it's by the what? By the renewing of your mind. There's something that happens within our head that we need to understand, that we need to know, that we need to be convinced of, the place where our salvation lies. He's my rescuer. He's my redeemer. He's the one I look to. And so Paul says that in order for you to have a complete armor set, you also have to have this understanding in your mind, this helmet of salvation. And then finally, like Paul, finally, bro, every one of these things, man, it's like it's this defensive thing. This war that's going on, we're playing defense, we're playing defense, we're playing deep. When are we going to get to the offense? Everything on the list so far has been a defensive thing. Five of the six. But now, <laughs> man, now Paul's in the position where it's, you need to have the sword of the Spirit. And what is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I think it's really interesting because this also represents the authority of the Scripture. If I have a sword and I am wielding my sword, fighting back the enemy, what I'm doing is leaning into the authority of of the scripture. John 1, 1 says to us that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word became God. When you're wielding the word, it is the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan out in the desert, what did he do? He quoted scripture. He had it on the inside of him. He was prepared for battle. He knew how to wield his sword. He was familiar with the weapon that had been given to him. And so he uses the sword to push back the darkness, to push back the purposes of the enemy in his life. And Paul would take all of these things and he would say, if you want to stand firm, 
then you're going to need to be prepared for battle and you need to be dressed when you're walking out the house. I've told this story before, but I like telling it. So I got the mic, I get to tell it again. A number of years ago, I was, I was all into like, let's just say I had a tinfoil hat on for a little bit and I was like, I'm convinced the world is doomed and gloomed and you, know, you, you need to protect yourself, protect your own, protect your family. And so I'm going through my house and I'm literally sweeping my house, looking through everything, going around the corners. I got firearms and I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to imagine worst case scenario. A lot of guys do this kind of thing, right? Maybe you don't tell anybody else. I, you know. So I'm going through my house. I'm going through all of this stuff. And I'm, 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 I literally, <laughs> I literally, I've gone, I have some military friends. So I've been collecting, I have helmets. I have chest plates for your front and your back. I have pads for your knees and your boots. I have a full get up. If you were to look at this like literally armor kind of thing, I got a full get up. I'm going through all of this kind of stuff. I'm thinking about how I would protect my family and the Holy Spirit drops on me right in the middle of all of this stuff. You are not prepared for the spiritual war that is taking place around you and you're focused on all of this other stuff and the devil has been getting into a foothold that you have left open oh. I made the comment about start messing with my family or my kids right and so when that realization oh I gotta shift I gotta shift gears God Help me. What does it look like? Help me to be more concerned, not with the natural that's temporal, that's going to fade away, but with the eternal. Help me to see God. And so I realized in that moment a few things. The unseen is real. And I hope you come to this realization as well. This is not just fictitious. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a cartoon. This is reality. The spiritual realm around us is just as real. And there is a devil that despises you and hates you and hates your children. He hates our church. He hates your worship. TJ, he hates when you start singing songs. I want to show you just how deep his level of hate is for you. Let me, let me just show you something. This is in Revelation 12, 10. It says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of heaven and God and the authority. This is describing the situation where he was kicked out of heaven a little bit here. So describing the authority of Christ that has come. We're going to come back to this. The authority of Christ that has come for thee. And here we go. For the accusers all right, of our brothers has been thrown down. And here's what he does. He accuses day or night. So I want you to see something for a minute. You have the devil that he's roaming around. He's seeking who he's going to devour. And he is not content with taking your life. He is not content with wrecking your marriage. He is not content with stripping you away from your finances and leaving you broke. He is not content there. Do you know how I know? Because even then, he still stands in front of your heavenly father and he begins pulling up your past, pulling up your mistakes, calling these things out. Why? Because they're going to create more destruction? No, your mistakes have already created the destruction. Do you know what he wants from you? Eternal damnation. It ain't just a, let's take him out in this life. You're an eternal being. The same one who had the influence to pull a third of all of the angels and get behind me, come with me, is now calling you, beckoning you, knocking on your door, tempting you to put yourself in the place of who God is supposed to be. And when we do, we open up doors, we get footholds, we get strongholds, and he won't stop. He will continue to accuse you before the Father. But the scripture says, the authority of Jesus has gone forth. Let's talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Next week, when we talk about this eternal damnation, I just, next week, so this week is about the personal thing. Next week is going to be about what happens to Satan in the end. What happens when that final judgment comes, 
What does it look like for him and all who follow? That's next week. Make sure you're here for us next week as we talk about this, okay? And so Satan, Lucifer, he makes this final, he makes this battle against us. He's waged war. It's against me. It's personal. It's against my family. For you, it's personal. It's against you, your loved ones. And so what do we do? How do we overcome? I want to give you just a few keys to victory, okay? So this is what it looks like as we're engaged in spiritual warfare. So one is the recognition to be prepared for the battle, to be prepared, to have your mind sober and alert and aware and conscious of what's happening around you. There is a battle going on. (laughs) My friends, it is just as scripted as like a WWE smackdown kind of match like we know what's going to happen we know where it's going but it's still real it's still happening it's still going down so being prepared for battle ephesians 6 10 this was right before where we were earlier he says be strong in the lord he's going to set this up this is kind of the summary if you're going into battle here's the armor this is right before this this is what he says be strong in the lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of god so that you can take your stand And he starts this out, be prepared, be strong. That was one I was really good at, is being strong. Not physical strength, but just sheer determination. You're not gonna beat me and I'm not gonna quit. Until I realized he was gonna beat me and I was ready to quit. One of the deceptions of the devil is to get you into your own strength. Do you notice that he says, be strong, not in and of yourself? Men, ego we got, I'm going to fix it. I'll make a way. I'm going to make this thing happen. Your source of strength, in order for you to be prepared for battle, is to realize that it's not be strong in Daniel. It's be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in, in my mighty power, in his mighty power. So be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. He says, and he goes on. The second way that we would have a key to victory is to recognize or to accept Jesus' authority. You can put the second one here. Recognize Jesus' authority. Let me show you a couple of things here and then expound. First Peter 3.22 says this. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated. So this is the ascension. He was here, rose again. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all of the angels and all of the authorities and all of the powers, they accept his authority. This is the same ones that we were looking at before, the rulers, principalities, authorities. This is the same words and language. And all of those things, both good and bad, are subject to his authority. They accept his authority. Authority. First John 3, 8 says this, that the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The last thing I need you to see in this, in talking about authority, and let me expound on this, is that when you and I are engaged in battle, it's important for you to know this, that you are not fighting from a position or for a position of victory. You are fighting from victory. You are not fighting for your victory. You are fighting from your victory. And the reason this is important for you to understand is that Jesus Christ has the ultimate authority. He is the ultimate authority. And so he has taken back permission from the devil. So when we fight, we already fight knowing the outcome. We fight from a position of victory, not so that I can overcome, but because I'm an overcomer. And so As we look at this idea again, so Jesus' authority in the name of Jesus. I love these places of scripture where you have demons who are presenting themselves, making themselves known. We could now see them. We couldn't see them before. And then there's places where, hey, Paul, I know, but I don't know you. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know, but I don't know you. You don't need to know me. You need to know the authority of Jesus. And that's the one that matters, right? So Jesus' authority, that's the umbrella that we find ourselves under. And then the second piece of this is why it's important. This is why it builds. The third one of this is to claim your own identity. Jesus is the authority, so be prepared for battle. Understand that Jesus is the authority, not you. Claiming your identity. Let me show you. Here it is in 1 John 4. It says, you, dear children, look at the language here. Where are you from? You are from God and you, 
you have overcome because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There has to be something that transpires inside of here, inside of here, that you begin to understand and claim your identity for who you are. When the devil comes beating on your door and knocking on your door, I am a child of God. I am forgiven of past mistakes, not because I didn't do them, not because they weren't wrong, but because of who Jesus is. So in these moments, what you have to do when there's, the devil is beating you back, when there's war that's going on, you need to understand that it is a part of your identity as a child of God that you are an overcomer. So many Christians with victim mentality, you are an overcomer. Do not stand back and get steamrolled by some devil. You are an overcomer. You are a child of God. This must be here, and it must be here. Claim your identity. All right, so here's another way. Is we deny the lie. Deny the lie. Deny the lie. Deny the lie. Do you know his weapons against you are so much around deceit? can't reach out and touch you, but he can tempt you. He can convince you. He can lie to you. He can deceive you. Your job in that moment is to look for the way of escape. Hey, that is a lie. It is not what my father says about me. That's not the direction that my marriage is going to go in. No, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And if he says that the birds of the air and the lilies of the field will be provided for, then so will I. I'm not believing a lie. So what do we do? We prepare for the battle. We accept the authority that is only through Jesus. We claim our identity as children and heirs. We deny the lies that are presented to us. We see this in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It says that we do what? We like to entertain arguments instead of demolish arguments. We demolish them. Demolish does not mean polish. Demolish means you TNT, you blow the thing up. You demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And what do we do? We take them captive and we make them obedient. One of the things that the devil is going to do to you is the same thing that he did to Eve. Did God really say that? Does God really love you? Are you really forgiven? Is there really any hope for you? You're too far gone. You're too lost. It's never going to be any different. Your circumstance never going to fill in the blank. Deny the lie. I recognize this as trash. And now I'm going to replace it with truth on the inside of my life. So here's deny the lie. And then the next one is proclaim the promise. When I recognize something as a lie, it's not enough to just acknowledge it. I need to begin to replace it. It's not enough to vacate the thought from the mind. No, I need to replace it with the truth on the inside of my brain that says, no, he's lying. And here's how I know, because here's what the truth says. I'm going to begin to proclaim the promise of God over my life. Here's what it says in 1 John 5, 18. It says that we know that we're children of God. Do you know that? This is an important part of it. We must know that we are children of God, that we don't make a practice of sinning because that's the thing that opens up the door and that door foothold being open leads to a stronghold. We know better than to do that. For God's son holds him securely and the evil one cannot touch him. The evil one cannot touch him, can tempt him and touch him. And I know this, and I'm going to lean into the promise of God. I'm doing to declare his word. I know that in Romans 8.32, it says that all of us are more than conquerors. We are convinced. I'm convicted of. You can't change my mind if you try to. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else at all. In all of creation, there is nothing under the son that is going to take me away from the relationship that I have with my heavenly father. That's what he says. 
some level of conviction must be transferred to you that becomes a core belief of who you are. Keys to victory, I'm more than a conqueror. How do I know? Oh, I'm so convinced of it, you can't talk me out of it. Last one. What do we do? What is the keys to victory? After doing these things, after preparing myself, after accepting the authority that is only through Jesus, after understanding and claiming my identity, denying the lie, proclaiming the promise, I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to stand my ground. This is what the scripture says to us, that be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Be on your guard. Be courageous. Stand firm in the faith. Uh, today, I'm wearing one of my favorite sweatshirts, but I don't dress this casual on Sunday. My mama would have my neck. She taught me better than that. If she had her way, I'd be wearing a three-piece suit. Okay, yeah, you know. My family is engaged in spiritual warfare. And sometimes, just to be honest with you, sometimes even as a pastor, as a husband, sometimes I, I'm not standing guard the way that I should be standing guard. The story that I told you earlier about playing military was from a few years ago, and just to be honest, the natural propensity is to kind of drift away from this idea. It's kind of easier to ignore or let things go the way that they play out. But the Lord has draw, brought my attention recently, and he has called me back into a place of, of warring again. The day and time that we're in, the deceit that's taking place, the things that are happening in our education system and the world around us, all of this stuff. Be on guard, be alert, be courageous, stand your ground, you're engaged in battle, be dressed for it. And so for me, I literally, I literally am taking this sweatshirt as a symbolism. I'm going into my upper room and I am praying and I am calling out to God. You are my source of strength and I refuse God. In fact, I stand in the face of the devil and I say, not today, Satan. Not on my watch, not when I'm at the helm, not when God has put me as the head of my household, as the father of my children, as the husband of my wife. Not today. Not today. I'm going to deny the lie. I'm going to proclaim your promise and I stand on your word. God, I am an overcomer. My children are overcomers. There will be no place for darkness to push into my household because we are slamming doors. No footholds here. You have no place in my marriage. You have no place in my finances, no place in my parenting, no place in my ministry, and no place in this church. I wish I could talk you into standing your own ground. I wish I could talk you into the importance of this. This is an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity for you to stand up to some things that have just been pushing you around. This is an opportunity for you to strengthen your core conviction within you. There is only one God. There is no angel. There is no demon. There is no devil in hell that will separate me from my father. This is an opportunity. And today, in this moment, this is an opportunity for you to do, maybe to borrow from me a little bit. Not today, Satan. Not going to happen. I'm going to invite you to stand on your feet. Look, I spent a lot of my life, and you've heard some of my stories before, I, I struggled, I did some stupid stuff, I was strung out on drugs, I had inappropriate relationship stuff. I spent a lot of my life there. I was deceived. Maybe you've believed some lies as well. Maybe you've still been living them. Maybe you're far from a truth that you know on the inside of you. 
what I want you to see is a war has been waged against you. You are not created to stand back and take it. What's at stake? It matters more than anything else you'll devote your life to. Possessions, materials, things that we chase after. The thing that we're talking about here, this is eternal. And so my encouragement for you today is to have a level of courage, to have a level of boldness, to be able to say, not today, Satan. And just a moment, we're going to pray, and the band's going to come, and we're going to sing a song. You know the song, This Is How I Fight My Battles. When we're engaged in warfare, we have to be alert, we have to be aware, we have to be conscious of what's going on around us. We have to take our position, our authority in Jesus, and we have to take a stand. So what I want us to do is as we pray, I want us to begin to let that become our own mantra, not today, Satan. And then as we move into song, I want us to be able to to declare that. I don't fight my battles with weapons of this world. No, I fight my battles through prayer and intercession, petitioning God. I fight my battles with the truth of God. I fight my battles with the strength that comes from my God. And so that's what we're declaring here today. If you're here and you feel like you're far from God, you feel like that somehow you still have footholds or you still have strongholds, I want to remind you of something. That the authority that Jesus has He says this, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Is free indeed. And so if there are strongholds, then it says that we have a power to blow those things up. And so today gets to be an opportunity to let go of them, to leave them behind, and to walk out of here differently than you came in. But you get to make a choice.